the aircraft carrier gets clogged, it doesn't start firing missiles. <laughs> the toilet system and the missile system are pretty well decoupled. And likewise, if an incoming missile comes, it doesn't start flushing the toilet. <laughs> These systems are modular, you know, they're, they're separate. And we do that in things like aircraft carriers, but we don't do it with computers. You know, a bug in the audio driver in an operating system can do all kinds of random stuff. Okay? And I think self-healing is also very important. That biological systems are pretty good at that. You know, that, you know life has existed on Earth for a long time because if you get a cut on your hand, you don't die. Okay? It's able to fix itself. And I think we need software which can repair itself. So if the software discovers a bug in the software, the software fixes the bug in the software. You know, it can't change the algorithm. But there's a lot of things it can do, and I think we need to move in that direction. That's what the large we're talking about. Also, in intelligent design, um, at least as applied to operating systems, um, I think the way to go is to have a small system. Okay? Minix is about 5,000 lines of code. L4 is a similar system, about 10,000 lines of code. It's not 4 million lines of code. Um, so it's fairly small, and you can get a grip on it. 5,000 lines of code, 50 lines per page, about 100 pages. So if somebody gave you a booklet with 100 pages of code, said, go read that, probably in a week you could read 100 pages of code, and you'd actually understand it, and you'd understand it. I mean, you know the whole thing. That's not true of 4 million lines of code. Um, there have been a lot of studies of bugs per 1,000 lines of code. And if you find a bug, you just fix it. Okay? But in industrial systems, it doesn't work that way. They have lots of tracking of you know, the software. So it, Something's been checked in, and then you fix a bug. They record that in their database, and they keep track of all these things, and they want to know what's going on. So people have studied these bug reports and the number of bugs per you know, version, and, and the first version's got more than the second version. But interestingly enough, it doesn't go asymptotically to zero. It goes asymptotically to a constant. You know? So the number of bugs in software never goes to zero. In industrial systems, it varies with the size of the module, and there's more parameters. But, you know, to a first approximation, fairly good industrial software done carefully by good people. You're talking about five to ten bugs per thousand lines of code. It's nearly impossible to get less than that. Okay? Um, not all of them are critical, but that's you know, the asymptotic bug rate. Um, there was a study of FreeBSD, which is a very well engineered system. Um, and they got three bugs per thousand lines of code. So they're doing a little bit better than the um, commercial thing. Linux is less well managed and less well organized than FreeBSD. My guess is their bug rate probably even higher than three bugs. I don't know, maybe it's four bugs or four, but it's not zero bugs. Okay. There's lots of bugs and so on. Um, Minix 3 is 5,000 lines, so it's probably got, you know, four bugs, 12, 15 bugs, something like that, at this bug rate, you know, three bugs per 1,000 lines. It's probably 15 bugs in the current. In the course of time, you might be able to find 15 bugs. It's not impossible if you eventually find the 15 <coughs> bugs. Linux probably has, using these statistics, Something like 12,000 bucks. Okay? They're not all fatal. I mean, some of them maybe, you know, it's printing a wrong error message or something like that. It may not be fatal. But unless these guys are in order of magnitude better than everybody else in the whole world, which I don't think they are, including being in order of magnitude better than free BSD, they're certainly not. It's probably something like 12,000 bucks. But it's actually worse than that. Because there's been a study of the Linux drivers by Dawson Engler, who's my grand student at Stanford. And Dawson found that the drivers tend to have three to seven times more bugs than the regular code. Lots of people look at the scheduler, and lots of people look at the virtual memory, but nobody looks at the printer drive. That's not exciting. You know, who wants to look at the printer drive? You know, this is all fun. Um, so nobody looks at it. So one person writes it, it's got full of bugs, and nobody ever looks at it. So, and to make, make it worse, about 70% of the code is drivers. So you've got 70% of the code is going to bug rate three to seven times worse than the rest of the system, and the rest of the system is bad enough. The result is, there's a lot of bugs in there. Um, one of my former PhD students is Werner Vogels, who's now chief technology officer of Amazon. And they run hundreds of thousands of machines, and they run them very hard. They're running, like, you know, hundreds of transactions a second. And he says they fail all the time. The failure rate is enormous. So if you're running one PC at home, and all you're doing is, oh, that's not me. Um, and everybody, um, you know, and all you're doing is reading mail or, you know, looking at the web, it doesn't fail much, well, you don't have good statistics. You know, when you start pushing it real hard, you know, running 100 transactions a second, 24 hours a day, and you have 200,000 machines doing that, you see failures all over the place. Okay? These are really pretty unreliable. My metric for when is it reliable enough, when manufacturers stop putting a reset button on the computer, usually on the front. <laughs> TV sets don't have a reset button. 
but all, as software is getting more complicated, maybe they didn't need them. But when the manufacturer says, why would I put a reset button on it? never fails. As long as they put a reset button on it, they have an expectation that it's going to fail, probably based on actual data. So I think you're going to make this probably modular. Um, in, in our case, modular means as many processes which cooperate together to run the operating system so it isn't a big blow. So here's the picture of the, uh, the architecture. Okay? Um, this is microkernel, which is 5,000 lines. It runs in kernel mode. It handles the interrupts and the traps and low-level process creation and then the scheduling and the inter-process communication mechanism. So it's very bare bones stuff. The machine, the plumbing to make everything work. It's got the clock driver in there. Um, the clock driver is very intimately associated with the scheduler. So it's a little bit inconvenient to have the clock driver out of it. But the clock driver is pretty small. It doesn't do much. It isn't really dangerous. And it's a thing called SIS. The kernel has an API, application programming interface, to the higher level. So it exposes certain functionality to the higher levels. And the sys package handles that functionality. Okay? I'll tell you in a minute what those things are. Um, on top of the kernel running in user mode are all the device records. That's the um, each one runs as a separate process with a disk driver and a network driver and you know, a monitor driver and all this stuff. Um, they all run as separate processes in user mode. So they're regular user processes with a little asterisk for regular means. On top of that, you've got servers, there's file servers, there's network servers, there's you know, all kinds of other servers that do you know, things for the system. And on top of that, of course, other regular user programs, you know, shell and make and GUIs and applications and whatnot. So here's the structure. Most of it runs in user mode. It's only about 5,000 lines of code that runs in kernel mode, and that absolutely has to work. If that fails, you know, you're dead in the water. It's only 5,000 lines that are critical versus, say, in Linux, 4, 4 million lines, any one of which can bring the system down. And here, you know, a bug in one of the drivers can't bring the whole system down, which brings part of the system down. And I'll discover, discuss in a minute the consequences of that. The kernel, as I said, exports an API. And, for example, since the drivers run in user mode, they can't touch the I.O. devices. Now, on the Pentium, it turns out, you can actually map the I.O. ports into user space. But that's not portable, because other architectures don't have that, so we don't want to do that, even though you can do it. Furthermore, of course, a bitmap of 65,000 bits per process to do that. Um, so, when a device driver wants to do I.O., what it does is, you know, it makes it a list of the I.O. ports it wants to read. It says to the kernel, go read these. The kernel reads and sends back an answer. But the kernel also checks to see if the process is allowed to read those ports. So, if you're trying to read, you know, if the audio driver is trying to read the disk ports, the kernel says, no, you protection error, you're not authorized to read those ports. You can read the sound card ports, but you can't read the disk ports. They're not, they're not yours. And did it right. And there's this uh, thing for interrupts. You can say interrupt policy, you hook up, you know, whatever. Um, and, um, you know, there's a way to copy data, which I'll describe later. You know, in a monolithic system like Linux, Linux or Windows, you know, the driver can copy data anywhere in the whole RAM, okay? Including places it shouldn't be copying it. There's no way to stop it. Okay. Here, that, that is very tight with control, as I'll describe in a minute. Um, you can change the memory map. This is needed for the primitive for exec, so you can you know, say it's a new process. Um, there's a way to control privileges, which I'll also describe. And there's a way to copy the process table out into your own address space. So if you need to read it, you make a copy, and it's yours. But if you write junk on it, it doesn't matter, because if you're writing junk on it, it's your own private copy. Okay. 